think we can get started. Welcome everyone to our weekly Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We're so excited to have Dr. Agarwal, Assistant Professor of Medicine at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, a gastroenterologist at Mount Sinai Hospital with a focus on inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, Dr. Agarwal graduated from Gandhi Medical College in India with an academic distinction and received multiple medical research scholarships and awards. She then completed her internal medicine residency here in New York at Maimonides and then went on to Montefiore to complete her gastroenterology fellowship. Uh, after that, Dr. Agarwal uh, did a uh, fellowship, advanced fellowship in inflammatory bowel disease at Lenox Hill Hospital. And she also received a master's in biostatistics at Columbia University. So many, many uh, amazing accomplishments. We're so excited to have you uh, here today, Dr. Agarwal. Currently, Dr. Agarwal is specializing in the care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. She has multiple publications in inflammatory bowel disease. And today she will be speaking to us about the role of the environment in inflammatory bowel disease. Dr. Agarwal, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Minira, for the very kind words and for inviting me, um, and also to the Department of Medicine. And thank you, everyone, for joining. So today, I will be talking about the role of the environment in IBD. Um, okay, so just to give a big picture of what IBD is, we all know as clinicians and as gastroenterologists, as internists, we see this part of inflammatory bowel disease, right? When the patient comes to us and they come to us with an uncontrolled immune response and bowel damage leading to symptoms such as diarrhea, abdominal pain, bleeding, and so on. And then we do investigations and we find out that they have IBD, we diagnose them with IBD and we treat them. How, however, there is this very long preclinical period of IBD, which we actually don't really see. It starts with a genetic predisposition to IBD, exposure to various environmental risk factors with downstream effect, effects on the microbiome, on intestinal immune function, on the tolerance, on the barrier function leading to disease initiation and subclinical inflammation, meaning there is inflammation at the tissue level in the intestinal mucosa, but because it's not presenting with overt symptoms, it remains undiagnosed. And this is the period intervention during which will be key towards preventing overt disease. And this therefore is our window of opportunity and thereby super important to understand this period and also to act during this period. It's kind of like an iceberg where we see the tip of the iceberg here, but the majority of the iceberg remains not visible to us. So what causes IBD, right? That is the big question that we have and we're exploring here. We know that genetic risk factors are key here. We know that the microbiome plays a really important role. Dysbiosis, specific taxonomic features are implicated in IBD and genes interact with the microbiome. And of course, the immune system. IBD is an immune mediated disease. There is immune dysfunction both at the mucosal level and at the systemic level. And all of these different categories of factors crosstalk with each other. However, um, just very quickly summarizing the genetic risk of IBD, we can see here that it doesn't explain to us the entire picture. So this was a, an extremely large GWAS analysis looking at specific SNPs implicated in IBD among different populations and broadly categorized as European and East Asian. So both for Crohn's disease and for ulcerative colitis, the SNPs implicated in IBD among Europeans tended to be more NOD2 mutations, IL-23 receptor mutations, and so on, whereas those among the East Asians were quite distinct. So the same mutations, the same genetic risk factors don't apply to divergent populations. Further, in this population-based cohort study, um, Jess et al. looked at genetic concordance among twins, and they separated twins into monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And they found that among monozygotic twins, meaning that their genetics were almost entirely the same, the concordance of Crohn's disease was only 64%. So only 64% of the disease risk was explained by genetics among individuals, among pairs of individuals that shared all of their genetic material. 
among dizygotic twins, the risk was much lower and that was 3.6%. So a big part of the puzzle is missing that is not explained by genes. And so what is this big piece? And that is the environment or the exposome. And again, the environment interacts with the genetics, with the microbiome, with the immune system. So it really is a whole network and an entirety of puzzle. And a lot of these factors have to come together to explain this risk. Now, we do a lot of epidemiology for various diseases in part to understand what the patterns are in part to prepare for the disease burden, but also to see how shifts in the environment can explain peace, explain to us what's going on and give us clues as to the risk for IBD. So with respect to IBD, it started to be diagnosed in Western countries of Europe and North America in the in late 1800s, early 19th century. And this was around the time the industrial revolution occurred in these countries alongside modernization, urbanization, changes in diet, changes in green space and so on. After which the incidence of IBD has been steadily climbing in these countries. Very interestingly, during those periods, so the early 1900s and so on, IBD was for the most part non-existent, very barely reported in developing countries and recently developed countries of Asia and Africa. However, this changed towards the 1990s where IBD started to get reported in these countries. And since then it has been climbing at an alarming rate. Granted, this is in part due to improved diagnostics, but the rate at which IBD is increasing in these countries is just so dramatic. And this again is in parallel with industrialization, modernization, change in diet, pollution, change in green space, medication use, fast food, and a whole bunch of other exposures and complete shifts in our environments and in our cultures. So does that give us some clues as to IBD risk? Potentially. Also, IBD incidence has been increasing in all age groups. So we conducted a population-based cohort study looking at uh, register-based data in Denmark for over a 20-year period, and we found that IBD incidence is con continuing to rise in Denmark, which is a developed country. So both for CD and for UC, IBD incidence is increasing. This is increasing in all age groups. So in the pediatric age group, in young adults, in older adults, and in elderly, both CD and UC incidence, incidence rates are rising. And the age distribution of the IBD population is also changing in that these individuals are tending to get older. Now, in all of the studies that we do to understand risk factors, we look at exposures and then we look at disease. What happens between the exposure, exposure and the disease for the most part remains a big black box when we consider clinical epi or traditional epi data. And now this new paradigm therefore is being introduced to understand the different aspects of what happens between the exposure and the disease and to sort of open this black box and understand this better. And this is known as the molecular epi paradigm and this is applicable to all chronic diseases. So start trying to tr unravel this molecular epi paradigm in the context of IBD. What are the data looking at the exposure and the disease? Multiple different studies, both smaller cohorts and large population-based studies have been done looking at different environmental factors and factors pertaining to hygiene, diet, sleep, medications, microbiome, all of these have been implicated in IBD. But also very importantly is the timing of these exposures. And it is only recently that we've started to recognize that the early life period is really key the early life period is when a child is undergoing microbiome maturation, immune system development. So any sort of hit during this period is especially critical towards the risk of disease later. And again, not just IBD, but many chronic diseases. And so now this period is becoming of special interest to, to many, many researchers because the effect during this period of an exposure is vastly different than the same exposure acting later in life. So for example, um, this is a model of the impact of maternal nutrition during pregnancy on metabolic syndrome later. 
So suboptimal maternal nutrition can lead to placental abnormalities, can be linked with other factors such as stress, infections, drugs, lead to altered fetal gene expression, downstream effects on metabolism, downstream effects on birth weight, and then effects on the postnatal environment and so on, thereby leading to metabolic syndrome. And this is again, just one model. There are many, many different ways whereby environmental risk factors can act like genetic mutations, epigenetic changes, mitochondrial dysfunction, endocrine disruption, nervous system dysfunction, and so on and so forth. So there's many different pathways and many different ways by which the environment can influence the risk of disease. Further, this period is critical also because intervention during this period prevents risk of disease. Intervention among adults may be too late and intervention early is key to reducing the risk of disease later in life as well as reducing the risk of disease in future generations, meaning this is a window of opportunity in terms of the big picture. Now, in the context of IBD, what are the different environmental factors that have been studied in the early life period? So we conducted a systematic review and meta-analyses looking at these factors, and we put together data from over 130 different studies, and we found that breastfeeding across studies was consistently protective in that children who were breastfed seemed to have a lower risk of IBD. And this was also impacted by the duration of breastfeeding that breastfeeding for longer than six months seemed to be more protective than breastfeeding for shorter durations. Exposure to smoke, so smoking during pregnancy, exposure to passive smoke during early childhood was harmful. Enteric and non-enteric infections seem to be harmful. Immigration and antibiotics were likely harmful, but the data seemed to be less robust. But for a whole set of exposures, such as birth month, mode of delivery, perinatal factors, social factors, and so on, the data seemed to be very noisy and unclear. And it wasn't obvious the, the, whether there was an association between these different risk factors and outcomes. And so this brings me to the relevance of rigorous research and using population-based cohorts and using cohorts that have complete data with a very long period of follow-up in conducting such research. So for that, I've been, um, I've been very fortunate to be uh, collaborating with uh, PREDICT, which is the Center for Molecular Prediction of IBD in Denmark, because they have access to a lot of different registers with complete data with um, continuous updates and cross-linked data using which we can study these questions that remain unanswered. So for example, we did a study looking at the risk of IBD in the offspring when the mother was exposed to antibiotics during pregnancy, because antibiotics have been implicated with microbiome changes, and they have been implicated in the risk of different diseases, including IBD, but the data seemed to be you know, not very clear, especially during the pregnancy period. And what we found that when we looked at one antibiotic course or two antibiotic courses compared to no antibiotics during pregnancy, there was no increase in the risk of ulcerative colitis. And that sort of fits because we know that shorter antibiotic courses and fewer antibiotic courses disrupt the microbiome but, but this effect seems to be more transient and, and individuals likely recover from this transient shifts in microbiome. However, when there were more antibiotic courses, three or more, then possibly because the microbiome changes become more sustained, there was an increased risk in ulcerative colitis and this risk was increased by 45%. Very interestingly, this was specific to ulcerative colitis and for Crohn's disease, there was no risk regardless of the number of antibiotic courses. We also did a study uh, similarly looking at the role of mebendazole, which is a broad spectrum anti-helminthic agent and the risk of IBD. So we, we, we sort of categorized this into two periods, early life exposure when the exposure to mebendazole was at age less than five years, or later in childhood. And the idea being that these parasitic infestations promote immune tolerance and, and, and eradication of these infestations with mebendazole during the early life period, and thereby potentially loss of immune tolerance may make an individual susceptible to IBD later. And we found that 
early life mebendazole exposure increased the risk of adult onset ulcerative colitis by approximately 30%. And again, this risk was specific only to UC and not associated with Crohn's disease, which kind of fits with our previous analysis um, in the influence of prenatal antibiotics on UC risk. So there is certainly the role of the early life period and, and exposures during this period are not the same as exposures later in life. We've also conducted analyses looking at um, the risk of immigration. So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis of population-based data looking at different immune-mediated diseases because IBD and other immune-mediated diseases have a lot of overlap and we can learn from different diseases. And we found that when individuals immigrated from countries like India, the Middle East and Africa to more developed countries, the risk of IBD, lupus, type 1 diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis consistently went up among immigrants. Again, pointing that the environment changed and that likely has to play a role because the genetic factors remain the same among individuals when they immigrate, but the environment is what changes. So we conducted, again, using the Danish registers, a study to explore the risk of IBD among immigrants. And we found that among first generation immigrants, the risk of IBD reflected the risk in the country that they were born in. So if they were born in a low risk country, the, the risk of IBD remained low. But if they were born in a high risk country, the risk of IBD went up. In their children, so second generation immigrants, so individuals born of immigrants, but born in Denmark, the risk was the same as that in native Danes, suggesting that the early life period and exposures and environment during this period are really influential in dictating the risk of life, uh, risk of disease later in life. H. pylori, which again so promotes immune tolerance potentially, has been linked with IBD in that H. pylori eradication puts individuals at risk for IBD. And these are data um, from the Taiwanese uh, National Registry, where they looked at uh, the cumulative risk of IBD events, as well as um, autoimmune diseases events, and found that consistently, given treatment for H. pylori, increased the risk of autoimmune diseases and IBD later. So again, fitting with the previous data that I've presented. Moving on to these epi data looked at from a slightly different measurement uh, methods. And these are these really novel techniques that have emerged in the last years when um, a lot of um, headway has been made using these kinds of uh, geographic information system data, meaning GIS or satellite-based data. And using these satellite-based data, we can get different kinds of data layers. So street data, buildings data, vegetation data, and integrating that, we can get a sense of how much green space or blue space or different kinds of pollutants an individual may be exposed to if we know their, um, their zip code or their coordinates of where they've been living. So using these data, um, and combining that with population-based health administrative data in Canada, a group looked at air pollution and found that maternal air pollution during pregnancy and early life exposures to nitric oxide, um, particulate matter, and ozone, they, they looked at these data and the risk of IBD and found that nitric oxide exposure during pregnancy put the babies at risk for IBD later. Relatedly, they looked at green space, and found that childhood exposure to green space was protective against pediatric onset IBD. There was a dose dependent effect and the associations were stronger when considering um, IBD onset during the pediatric time period. So again, uh, emphasizing the early life period. But what are these mechanisms? How does green space protect one against IBD? Is there a direct link? Is green space a surrogate for more healthy living, diet, stress, exercise? Is green space acting through biodiversity? Because if someone lives more in green space, they're likely to be exposed to more um, to different organisms. Or does green space mean less air pollutants? So there are a lot of different factors at play, and it's very difficult to tease out each one of them. 
And what we don't, we don't know what we don't know. So if we're thinking about an exposure, we can study it, but there's so many different exposures that we don't even know about. And since we don't know about them, we wouldn't be measuring them. And that creates a lot of bias and a lot of black boxes, which are very difficult to understand. So I put together this DAG or directed acyclic graph, sort of giving a sense of how all of these factors are connected to each other. So for example, if we're talking about maternal smoking during pregnancy and how that may increase the risk of IBD, maternal smoking during pregnancy can also lead to premature birth. It can also, premature birth can affect antibiotic use. Those can be linked with enteric infections low birth weight, and so on and so forth. And you can see how, again, all of these are a tight network of many, many different factors. And unraveling this is, is really difficult, especially considering when there's confounding, interaction, mediation, and when a lot of this is unmeasured. Further limitations with these data are that often they're retrospective, there's geographic heterogeneity, these are associations, lack of mechanistic data, biases and so on and so forth. So this brings me to the next step in the molecular epi paradigm, which is looking at the internal dose, which is measured using different kinds of omics. I'm sure uh, many and most of us have heard, heard about omics, which are high throughput data that can be measured in biological samples. And you can measure the epigenome, the transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and these can be linked to different kinds of exposures. And these are specific molecules that can be measured and their doses can be assessed. And there, there are thousands of different molecules that can be measured in a sample. So these are unbiased, unsupervised molecules, which we don't necessarily have to think about to measure them. They're present in the array that is being used. They give us insights into different exposures, as well as downstream effects on diseases. And now this entire paradigm has shifted or is shifting towards use of these multiomics in study of uh, causes of disease and pathways of disease. For this, we can use two broad categories of cohorts. We can use early life cohorts. So looking at early life, um, early life uh, biological samples and early life omics, as well as pre-diagnostic cohorts. So focusing now on these early life events, there are many different cohorts in the context of IBD that have come out, such as the meconium cohort, the tooth fairy study, and the PREDICT center, which I had mentioned earlier. The meconium cohort is, is a really interesting cohort at Mount Sinai that was established in 2014 by Drs. Inga Peter and Jean-Fred Columbell. This is a cohort of women with IBD and without IBD that were recruited during pregnancy, followed through the course of pregnancy with stool samples, saliva collected during each trimester alongside questionnaires. And at the time of birth, we collected umbilical blood cord, placenta, meconium from the babies. And now the babies have been followed with periodic stool sample collection over different time points. And many of these babies are now between five and seven years of age. So we have data for many years on these moms and these babies, especially during the early life period, which is critical to understand the risk of disease later. So using these data, we found that babies born of mothers with IBD have a distinct microbiome compared to babies born of healthy control moms. Their microbiome had lower alpha diversity and their microbiome also had very significant, significantly different taxonomic features in that babies of control moms had more bifidobacteria and babies of IBD mom had more proteobacteria and other kinds of bacteria. So they were quite dysbiotic and differences, differences in taxonomic features. Further, we measured uh, fecal calprotectin, which is a marker of intestinal inflammation. And we found that babies of IBD moms had higher fecal calprotectin, and this was sustained up to three years of age, which was the duration of follow-up when the study was done. And, and um, this indicates there is some degree of intestinal inflammation among babies of IBD moms. And remember that babies of IBD moms are genetically more susceptible to IBD than babies of healthy control moms. Now, whether this microbiome changes or these, this intestinal inflammation, how relevant that is towards the risk of IBD later, we don't know yet, 
but certainly something is happening at a subclinical level in the context of IBD in moms. We also compared the signatures by country. We looked at uh, calprotectin and microbiome differences in babies and in mothers who were from Hong Kong and in the US because we also have recruit, uh, recruitment patients um, that were recruited in Hong Kong. And we found that among women with IBD compared to those without, the microbiome diversity was lower in both countries. Among offspring of women with IBD compared to those without, the diversity was even lower in the US compared with Hong Kong. And this sort of points again, this not points, but this sort of um, reinforces the idea that there are differences in, in our environment and in the country that we live in and sort of uh, goes along with the data on immigration in that the risk of IBD and other diseases may be lower in developing and recently developed countries. And when individuals moved or immigrate to more developed countries, their risk changes. So emphasizing the role of the early life period as well as the role of the environment. Different samples can be studied to understand these risk factors. This is a novel study uh, done by my colleague, uh, Joanna Torres, Inga Peter and others. And they looked at deciduous teeth. So the milk teeth of babies can be studied to, and, and they can be um, cr cut cross-sectionally. And the different layers of teeth can be studied using mass spectrometry and different compounds, including heavy metals can be measured. And these can be considered analogous to rings of a tree. Um, and, they, and, and different rings represent different phases of development. And because the um, growth of teeth starts around 10 weeks of pregnancy, um, these uh, matrix biomarkers can measure cumulative exposures starting as early as the second trimester. Um, so, in, so using these teeth, um, a pilot study was done measuring heavy metals um, and Nair et al found that lead copper, zinc, and chromium were heavy metals, which were different among babies who went on later to develop IBD versus those who didn't. And these differences were especially relevant during the prenatal period, except for in case of lead, where these differences were relevant throughout. So this was quite fascinating. First, it this gives us uh, another modality, another set of biological specimens to study. And these can give us an inkling into exposures during the pregnancy period and give us a lot of insights into different risk factors, which otherwise would be impossible to study. Another source of samples which is emerging is these blood spots. Um, so in the US, in many states and in many developed countries, after the baby is born, a few drops of blood spots are collected via heel prick onto a filter paper card known as a Guthrie card, and they're saved over decades. And the purpose of this is in the event they may be needed to study for inborn errors of metabolism, they could be leveraged. These cards are little pieces of paper and they can be studied, they can be stored with very little requirements in terms of resources and funding, and they can be maintained at uh, either in the refrigerator at four degrees or even at lower temperatures in the freezer. And then these can now be leveraged to use uh, to, to study various omics, such as uh, genomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, and so on, and measure different hundreds and thousands of different chemicals to get a sense of different exposures and link them to disease later in life. So using these blood spots, we're in the process of conducting metabolomic analyses um, in the meconium cohort. So more data on this later, um, but using these untargeted metabolomics, small molecule features have been studied and they have been linked with different diseases uh, later in life. And in this pilot study, Patrick et al. measured these omics and found that very distinct signatures were present at the time of birth, and they predicted the risk of acute lymphoblastic leukemia both early and later onset. So this is really a promising avenue for research to understand the different um, biological responses to exposures and the downstream risk of disease. Moving on to the next step in this paradigm, which is the biologically effective dose, 
Now, as I mentioned before, these different exposures and risk factors can lead to many different changes, such as oxidative stress, genomic changes, and so on. And these can be measured in different biological samples. Epigenetics are becoming recognized as potentially putting individuals at risk for many different diseases. Epigenetic changes are um, alterations in the DNA that happen at the time of birth or later in birth. And risk factors such as smoking and pollutants puts individuals at epigenetic, epigenetic changes risks. These involve DNA methylation and can be studied using EWAS or exposome-wide uh, exposome association studies. And um, a lot of different studies are being done to understand DNA methylation signatures or exposome analyses in the context of risk of disease later. So for example, this was a very large EWAS analysis looking at the risk of IBD based on early based on exposure to um, smoking during the early life period. And the purpose to demonstrate this slide is to indicate how many different SNPs and DNA methylation sites have been implicated in the risk of IBD later in life. Epigenetic changes have also be, been studied post-diagnosis. So in this uh, cohort of children and adults diagnosed with IBD, um, um, the investigators looked at peripheral blood as well as at the intestinal tissue and conducted EWAS analyses and found that specific um, uh, DNA methylation signatures were present in the context of uh, uh, pathways pertaining to CD8 plus T cells, um, and they predicted IBD phenotypes and outcomes. So meaning that all of these pathways give us insights into the risk, in, into the pathways from exposure to disease, and give us a little piece of the puzzle. Analysis such as these uh, after disease onset could be because these risk factors lead to disease, but it could also be because of reverse con uh, causation in that IBD may lead to epigenetic changes. And so it becomes a little bit tricky to unravel. And that is why it is important to understand all of these signatures before the onset of disease. So that brings me to the different preclinical effects, meaning the different signatures that may be present prior to disease onset. Um, which would be this phase of disease initiation and subclinical inflammation. And for this, we uh, many different cohorts have been put together uh, across the world to understand this better, such as the PREDICT cohort, the GEM project, the Road to Prevention, as well as the PREDICT Center in Denmark. So just a few data uh, from these different cohorts. So this was a really interesting cohort put together by my mentor, Jean-Fred Columbell, and this is a military cohort. So in the military, all recruits undergo periodic um, health health based testing and uh, and uh, and different and different uh, lab tests and as a part of this uh, they get blood draws and serum is saved over decades so we put together a cohort jean fred put together a cohort um, of individuals who who ended up being diagnosed with crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and started to analyze biological samples, the serum samples prior to diagnosis. So uh, he was able to get access to samples at diagnosis, two years before diagnosis, four years before diagnosis, and up to seven to 10 years before diagnosis. And in these serum samples, uh, they ran um, different um, proteomic analyses and antibody analyses to look at ASCA, which is anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody, um, C antibodies to different mi microbial antigens, such as CBER, uh, FLAX, OMPC, and so on. And then they also conducted proteomic analyses. And what they found was that various antimicrobial antibodies were significantly elevated prior to Crohn's disease diagnosis. Um, and also there were specific proteomic signatures pertaining to inflammatory pathways that were elevated for many, many years prior to disease onset. And if you put together um, all of these markers, the predictive, the predictive ability of these markers was quite high up to many years, up to five years prior to diagnosis, 
with area under the curve ranging from 0.76 to 0.85, meaning that there was a very high predictive ability of these markers. So there is a long preclinical phase, and there are alterations in proteomics and these antibodies telling us that this is the period which if we which needs to be studied more and can be used to predict who will get IBD later or not. Um, my colleague Ryan Angaro uh, looked at a similar leveraged the same cohort looking at a complementary analysis, looking at different metabolomic features. And they found that features pertaining to bile acids and steroid hormone biosynthesis were associated with Crohn's disease. Metabolites involved in different amino acid pathways were associated with Crohn's disease, and metabolites associated with fatty acid synthesis pathways were related to UC. So this gives us insights into the different pathways that are perturbed and altered in the course of disease onset, um, giving us you know, another piece of the puzzle. Moving on to the GEM project, this is a really great cohort in Canada uh, by Ken Truturo and colleagues in which individuals who are family members of individuals with Crohn's disease have been recruited and they've been followed prospectively over a long period of time. And uh, at the time of recruitment, um, the investigators measured the intestinal barrier function using the lactulose mannitol test. And they found that there were two broad categories of individuals individuals who had normal barrier function and those who had impaired barrier function based on this test at the time of recruitment. So they were all asymptomatic. They just had normal or abnormal barrier function. And they found that on long-term follow-up for up to 10 years, people who had impaired barrier function were at a much higher risk of developing Crohn's disease compared to people who had normal barrier function indicating again that there is this long preclinical phase during which the barrier function may be altered and that puts people at risk for developing Crohn's disease later in life. So there are many different omics that can be studied. We can study the barrier function, metabolomics, epigenetics, proteomics, antibodies, and we have to put together all of these different pieces of puzzles so as to understand better what the composite picture or what the composite puzzle is. And for that, it is critical to do something called network analysis. All of these omics, they, they sound really great, and they are, but also they are very high throughput data, meaning that each analysis will give you thousands and thousands of different data points. And so it becomes, it's challenging to separate a real signal from noise, and it requires very sophisticated um, statistical and bioinformatics techniques to, to integrate these omics data, to integrate one set of omics to integrate omics across different platforms, as well as from different cohorts. And that requires very sophisticated network analytic techniques. And this field is moving at a very fast pace. And we're making a lot of headway in understanding all of these different techniques and understanding all of these different omics and sort of putting together the puzzle. And so if we were to put together what we know about the puzzle so far, we know that various exposures put, puts one at risk for IBD. This includes antibiotics, country of birth, early life infections, medications, pollutions, biodiversity, and so on. These lead to alterations in metabolomic signatures, um, and they can be measured as biomarkers of intestinal exposures. We can conduct analyses of metals in biological samples, in serum samples, in stool samples, in teeth, in blood spots. We can then go on to measure what the further downstream effects are, such as DNA hypermethylation, such as changes in intestinal barrier function, and so on. And this, again, is an evolving field and very rapidly changing. Um, and we can then understand what the preclinical effects are, such as elevated calprotectin, dysbiosis, proteomic and anti antibody signatures. And finally, this leads to disease, which we diagnose clinically, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And so putting together this entire picture is really critical towards understanding IBD pathogenesis, 
towards understanding therapeutic strategies, because the more we understand about these different pathways, we can target specific pathways and specific molecules to improve our therapeutics and improve the care of our IBD patients to predict disease risk. And understanding these, these different signatures can measuring them and understanding them, we can identify who is at risk for developing IBD so that we can potentially intervene and perhaps even prevent IBD. And I think from a public health standpoint and from an overarching standpoint, prevention is, is, is the goal and it's kind of our North Star. And, and to characterize this entire pathway so that we can one day prevent IBD would be tremendous. Um, and with that, I would just like to add, um, again, if I've not convinced you yet, that the environment is so critical towards our health, and really the environmental health mediates human health, and as our environment is shifting so rapidly, and, and there are so many changes happening at such a great pace, it's really important to be cognizant of how these shifts influence us, not only in the context of IBD, but in the context of health and disease overall. And, you know, awareness is step one towards mitigation and taking steps to fix everything that's going on. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention um, and my mentors and my colleagues and all the great cohorts uh, I get to work with, um, uh, Columbia and, and my funding sources. So thank you again for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions and your comments. Wonderful. Thank you so much for Dr. Agarwal for such an incredible uh, grand rounds. Really, you know, with the changing world, I think it's always so important to look at the environment and, and how it, you know, changes our approach to chronic conditions that we see in our community. So thank you for that. Um, I see Dr. Berger has his hand raised. Dr. Berger. Yes, Dr. Agarwal, thank you. Um, love omics. Love them all. You introduced me to a couple that I didn't know existed. Well, didn't know the exact names for, but so thank you for that. Um, maybe you mentioned it, I just missed it uh, in today's world with lots of distractions. Um, sort of in the, in the last couple of omics, the, the metabolomics, and um, then there was another omics after that. You know, I love them. I think they're great. I, I guess the one thing I was sort of missing when you were talking about a lot of these markers, um, and then the next group was sort of like the uh, the, the lactulose uptake at the gut, the, the permeability. At least in one of those two, you talked about it as sort of like following a group of people and watching them, high risk people and watching them over time. For your controls, were you just using like the, con the control group as sort of the reference range for these labs and known values? Or were you using something, um, you know, particularly with some of the inflammatory markers, were you using groups of other inflammatory diseases or something else like with your control groups or just a random cross section of the population where the it's, any of these can be abnormal in a host of disease, maybe not the, the gut uptake one, but like some of the CRP and some of these other markers you mentioned. So like how well and how predictive are those other than outside of something going on specific to UC and IBD or Crohn's disease, right? So if you have some of these markers elevated, how well, if they're not specific markers to the disease itself, how well do we know that they will develop into Crohn's disease or is it only to be taken, like if your mom has Crohn's disease and now your markers are up, you're gonna have it in the next 10 years. Like, I just wanted to clarify that for how we think about these things, because often a statement can be taken in a lot of different directions, and I was about to take it in a lot of different directions. So wanted to get your yes. insight on that. Absolutely. So thank you for uh, your comments and for this really great question. And I completely agree with you that it's really critical to separate um, 
a specific predictor or a specific biomarker and and what what that biomarker means in terms of the risk of disease, whether it's very specific to Crohn's disease or it's just a marker of inflammation, thereby pertaining to other diseases as well. Um, so in the GEM cohort, which, uh, which I uh, presented here, um, these are individuals, these are first degree relatives of individuals with Crohn's disease. So they are at risk for Crohn's disease. It is true that they may also be at risk for other immune mediated diseases because the Crohn's disease and other diseases are linked with each other. So that is true. Um, and the specific omic or the specific uh, preclinical marker that they studied in this cohort what was intestinal permeability, which they, which they measured using the, the mannitol, the lactulose mannitol ratio test. Um, and, and, and so this loss of a change in intestinal permeability or loss of barrier function indicates intestinal inflammation. And so this is very specific with Crohn's disease or, and or ulcerative colitis, but you're correct that this is not Crohn's disease or UC per se. This could perhaps indicate other things going on the, in the intestinal tract, absolutely. Um, it does not necessarily mean Crohn's disease, but individuals who had high um, intestinal permeability had a higher risk of developing Crohn's disease later. So when they were followed for up to 10 years, many of them did develop CD. Um, so in that sense, I think this is a really good study because this marker is very specific to the gut. But if we were to use other signatures of inflammation, such as C-reactive protein and so on, that would be much more nonspecific, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. I think we have another question, Dr. Matsuo So. Uh, hi, I'm Matsu. I'm one of the PGY3 residents here at uh, MSBS. So I, I learned that um, it was a long time ago that smoking can potentially help the symptoms or like reduce the risk of developing ulcerative colitis. Like what's the current understanding of this background pathophysiology? Like is this related to the epigenetics that you mentioned? Um, that's my question. Thank you for this really great question. And this is one of the mysteries of IBD. IBD has many, many mysteries. This is one of them. And the short answer is we don't know. The mm -hmm. long answer is that there are a lot of different, even though there's a lot of overlap between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, um, there are clear differences in pathways as well as in risk factors, as you saw uh, in, in, with respect to antibiotics, um, antiparasitics and so on. And so in the context of smoking as well, smoking very clearly increases the risk of Crohn's disease. It has been linked with worse outcomes in Crohn's disease in terms of fistulizing disease, lack of response to mm. anti-TNF agents and so on. But you're absolutely correct that in ulcerative colitis, smoking is paradoxically linked in that it may actually be linked with a milder disease course and often you see onset occurs when individuals stop smoking. We see that in our patients a lot. Why this happens, we don't know. It is a matter of great debate and a lot of ongoing research. And potentially this could be linked with epigenetics, yes. But TBD, we don't know this yet. Really great question. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Matsuo. What other questions or comments do we have for Dr. Agarwal? I think while we're waiting, I actually have a question for you, Dr. Agarwal. So, um, you know, I know you mentioned how um, genomic uh, criteria and, and, you know, exposure from the environment around us probably contributes, you know, to the development of IBD. Do you think from the work that you've done, that there's a particular vulnerable period, either in the you know in the womb or as we grow up in our uh, early years, that you know really puts you at risk for IBD, or do you think it is the chronic exposure of all those risk factors, both on the DNA level and the environmental level, or do you think maybe it's a combination of of both? I know it's a hard question to answer, but. Um, just curious what the studies show in terms of that. 
This is an excellent question. Thank you, Munira. This is such a great question. And I think it sort of speaks to how complex IBD is and how complex it is to unravel the pathogenesis or the pathophysiology of IBD and any disease for that matter. Um, I think that exposures that happen during the early life period are sort of an initial hit that may that that affect immune function leads to some degree of immune dysregulation and altered microbiome signatures and make an individual susceptible to IBD and potentially other immune mediated diseases. And so in this background of increased susceptibility, future hits as we grow older in terms of perhaps more antibiotic uses, smoking, um, other infections and various other risk factors, um, one develops IBD. So I think, I think it's the third that you said that it's a combination of different factors. And I think the timing of the exposure is really important. Um, whether cumulative risk factors play a role, that's a great question. I think in the context of factors such as antibiotics, they do. Smoking also, they probably do, although this is purely hypothetical um, on my part, because all of these epigenetic changes and microbiome changes seem to be more accumulative. Um, whether it's true for all environmental exposures cannot be said, but I think, I think um, you know, with each exposure, one has to sort of go back to the drawing board and, and, and think about each exposure and how it interacts with different exposures and the timing of exposure in a very different way. Great, thank you so much. Any other questions, comments, Dr. Nagar? I had a question. Sure. Uh, thank you for a great talk. This was really uh, fascinating and interesting. Um, I uh, so I'm, I'm a huge proponent of of breastfeeding, and I've read a lot of the literature, uh, not necessarily as it pertains to IBD. But what I have found interesting about a lot of the literature is that it, it's not very clean at all because. Um, oftentimes, you don't know whether it's the breastfeeding that's protective or it's the not introduction of formula, um, which is the main factor. Um, and then the other issue, I mean, I think it's, it's well known that breastfeeding prevalence is much higher in higher socioeconomic uh, groups and more educated groups at this juncture. And so is it that that's, that's the, you know, the factor that's playing, a, a, that's having a protective role? Or is it the actual breast milk? And I don't know if you if you have delved in at all um, in this space. That is an excellent question, also, and and we've absolutely talked about this. Whether it's breastfeeding or exactly what you said, other variables associated with breastfeeding, and breastfeeding may just be a confounder, one or not even, or maybe an interaction variable or a mediator. One hundred percent. I think. I think so. With respect to breastfeeding, um, different components of breast milk, such as specific um, antibodies, specific um, oligosaccharides, um, fatty acids, and other components of breast milk, and their effect on the baby's microbiome um, and, and different met metabolites have been studied. And it seems like these specific components do have a positive role on the microbiome and specific metabolites. Again, not IBD per se, but in, ge in, in general. So based on some mechanistic data, it does seem that breastfeeding is protective, but I do agree with you that it's entirely possible that it's formula feeding that's harmful. And in, in theory, not to say that it's harmful as a blanket statement, but, but you know, specific food constituents such as emulsifiers and coloring agents have been linked with intestinal inflammation, alterations in, uh, in barrier function and alterations in specific microbiome signatures. Whether that plays a role in, in leading to changes in microbiome function and intestinal barrier function in the babies, we don't know. Is it possible? Absolutely. What you said about the higher socioeconomic status and the other variables linked with it, 100% could be part of the story. Um, so your point is very well taken. I completely agree with you.
Thank you, Daphne and Dolly. Okay, I think we have about five minutes left. Dr. Riss, great talk. All very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Riss. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, I think uh, we can say once again, thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal, for joining us today and, and giving us this wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining. See you next Monday. Bye.